What up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gym Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, Quantum Mania is not doing very well overseas, Brian. This, Brian, uh, we were hoping that the numbers for, or I'm pretty sure not us, Brian, but Disney was hoping that the numbers for overseas we're going to uh, bring up the overall uh, incoming uh, box office for, for Quantumania. And it doesn't seem to be doing that, Brian. Uh, this just further uh, tells us, Brian, that people all over the world <laughs> literally are not <laughs> <laughs> feeling this. We talked about it in our, in our review but I think we're, we're seeing it borne out in the audience response, which is Ant-Man received a B cinema score that equaled the lowest that the Marvel movies ever gotten. Uh, Eternals is the other. Those are also the two most critically rejected films Marvel has had, at least by, by Rotten Tomatoes. But the, as you say, the, the one wild card was that this was the first movie um, really since before the pandemic where china had allowed a a same day release as the us and ant-man one and two despite being smaller scale in the marvel family have been very successful in china so ant-man 2 was about 620 million global box but over 100 million i think about 120 million of that came from china alone but ant-man 3 had a dismal open in china only 19 and a half million dollar opening weekend wow. so you can you can scale it down from there. So this movie is <laughs> not even going to make probably $50 million in That's China. That's crazy. So the first chance the Chinese audience has had a chance to see a Marvel movie on a big screen the same day as the rest of the world, they didn't show. And, and that's with theaters mostly reopened over there at this point. So it's kind of saying that this, the second largest audience that Marvel used to be able to reliably bank is just not there for them right now. Yeah. or certainly not to the same degree. So as a result, you saw this interesting split where Ant-Man's U.S. box office actually wound up okay relative to the projections, but the global actually fell a bit short. And at about $240 million for an opening weekend, with this kind of lukewarm response from audiences and critics alike, I think you got to start looking at, you know, Doctor Strange 2, Thor last year, those movies drop by 67, 68% that second weekend. And if Ant-Man does that, you're looking at an Ant-Man 3 that's going to be probably pretty close to Ant-Man 2 in terms of its box office, despite the introduction of Kang. And that, as we know, is not what Marvel was counting on, considering the whole pitch of this was this is an Avengers-level project introducing our big villain to kick off Phase 5. Is it's statements like those, Brian, that get you in trouble. That when you speak big game like that, and when we get there, it's whatever. That credibility is like almost quiet, crying wolf. You keep saying these things are gonna be dope. That there's gonna they're gonna be compared to this and that and this, and then it isn't. Is like that need to see it that weekend, Brian, is is especially for those who wait to hear what reviews have or critics have to say. And then you see what critics are saying and some audience members and people out there. People, there's people out there who do their YouTube channels and podcasts. Are not, they're, not, they're, not, they're not praising this movie. They're praising certain aspects of this movie, certain, in, certain performances. But the overall movie is a disappointing movie. And just people are just not showing up for these things anymore. Like I said, Brian, it's like, I don't want to go to the movies for this. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, no one metric is everything. Rotten Tomatoes, not everything. Cinema score yes. is not everything. But trends, trends are what I think you pay attention to. And that's after Thor 1, 
got a B plus cinema score, which I th- actually think in retrospect is kind of underrated. <laughs> I think it's a little better than that personally. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Marvel had twenty one consecutive films where the cinema score was an A minus, an A, or an A plus. Twenty one in a row. Four of their last That's six. Crazy. It's crazy, right? That's the thing is, put that in perspective. Don't take that for granted. But four of the last six projects have now had a, a B level cinema score. So that is telling you something. That's a trend that is saying the audience's reception of what is being given to them is not going down the same way that it used to. And I think that critics, I still think the critical score for this movie is a little bit low, quite honestly. But I think what it is telling me when you look at the trend line of the fact that Love and Thunder's Rotten Tomatoes is the same as Dark World, and you see Eternals, and you see the scores drifting lower and lower and lower, what it's telling me is that critics and audiences alike are saying the Marvel formula that we enjoyed and that we embraced for all that time, we're not okay with you doing more of that. That's what, that's how I read it. That's not good enough anymore. Yeah. And I think, I don't think Marvel's gotten that message yet, at least in terms of the output, but I think the audience and the critics are telling you, it's not that we hate Marvel on principle. It's that what you're giving us isn't good enough to satisfy us in the wake of Endgame. This makes me think about, Brian, when James Gunn talked about we're not going to announce films down the line that don't have scripts. Yep. I mean, it worked before. What happened? Is it? I, I, that's what I'm trying to understand. Like, what happened? Is is it a case of? I don't. I don't know how to. I don't know how to explain this. This downturn of bad films. I'll give you three things that we we talk, we obviously have another future show that we talked about, but I, I've spent more time thinking about this than I probably should have, quite honestly. <laughs> but I, I hit on, I hit on a couple, uh, three more things. I'll, I'll meter them out as I think of them. I think number one is Marvel has lost their way in terms of a little bit in terms of having the primary focus of the individual project be on the main character's journey and development. I think they did a very good job with Iron Man, Thor, Captain America, Ant-Man even, of having a charismatic lead with some sort of dilemma, some sort of problem that you watch them wrestle with over the course of movie one, movie two, movie three, so that even though you knew that those projects were pointing you with these Easter eggs and these storylines towards something much bigger, You could enjoy them on their own because there was an interesting story and an interesting kind of character arc within them, right? So we always hold up Winter Soldier as like the best MCU movie. And look, Winter Soldier, I think, is necessary viewing if you're going to make your way toward Avengers Endgame. But you can watch Winter Soldier and love that film and not watch a single other MCU project. Bird up. So I think that is one thing that has kind of started to decrease with these more recent pri- It's felt like you need more stuff around the other real or recent projects to actually get what's going on, Ant-Man 3 included. So that's number one. I think number two is, I think the movies don't look as good. And we'll get to that with Ant-Man 3. There is definitely a visual problem. I think people are kind of rejecting the look and feel of what Marvel has become. The VFX monster has really kind of taken on a life of its own. It came back with this movie. I got some quotes we'll get to in a second. But I think if you even go back to like some of the older MCU project, again, like a Winter Soldier, they were, maybe it's because they were more grounded. Like that's a more streets movie. Like it's just in the real world, but they just looked more tangible. And I almost feel like as we've gotten more cosmic and gotten more bizarre, 
maybe it's losing a little bit of touch with audiences, but they're definitely complaining about what they're seeing visually. That's number two. And I think number three, and I gotta, I'll throw this back to you because it's really a question. Is the multiversal storytelling just not working on the big screen or did that. No Way Home steal everything that was good and powerful about it? So the audiences responded to that and now are kind of like, why do I care about that? I already saw No Way Home. I got the multiversal thing. Why do I need to watch 10 more? do you think that that i mean you can't fix that mistake now but like do you think that that's just not working as like a plot device before i get to that one remind me if i forget but there was one thing you talked about in terms of uh, vfx and all that other stuff um guardians of the galaxy infinity war endgame all these things were fantastic brian well they look they look fine yeah i thought they looked great but now that that part of it is being neglected for i mean there are reasons for it brian which you'll talk about in a few uh so for me there's like you know it's a shame that that has to take a hit for whatever quarter you have to meet and to answer your third uh, point brian this is something that we spoke about a couple of years ago brian during the pandemic We said, or we asked the question possibly, Brian, is the multiverse too big of a or complicated thing? With Loki, they did a good job of getting us ready for what this will would be. But it never went further than that. And it sort of, I think we needed to come to a much quicker conclusion and if you wanted to try something different i think going about it by doing giving us a kang movie instead of uh what we got here um would have worked better i think this long form for the for the amount of stuff that we've been getting we are no further along it seems to understanding what's going on which i think brian has introduced introduced to, for for the writers perhaps a complexity that they're still trying to figure out. Hence, we're getting these other things that may connect to the multiverse, uh, but it, but it may not. And it's just when we do get back to the multiverse, it's like, okay, where were we? What's going on? I don't know. I think that's a great point. So I think what Loki did so well was synthesize the rules that that show needed. But I think we interpret it as, okay, this is chapter one of the manual. And we're kind of still waiting for chapter two, quite honestly. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it just felt like multiverse. And I thought about it too. We, we had a discussion, you know, we love, you know, we love Kang's performance. We wanted more Kang. We want but it, you know, when, when we think about this issue, he who remains, had a ton of exposition in that Loki finale where he's effectively explaining the origin of the multiversal war. This Kang makes a lot of cryptic references about time, that time is not what you think, but he never actually breaks down. What does that mean? Like we as an audience, what, how do you connect us to his perception of time? And what we're left with, which I'm starting to question a little bit more as a device is, so they introduce he who remains. Sylvie kills him. Spoiler alert. Yeah. They introduce this Kang and effectively seem to have destroyed him. Spoiler alert. At the end of this movie, which then leads to Council of Kang. And we get, okay, now maybe the real Kangs we're supposed to care about are Ramatut, Immortus, and I don't know if that's Iron Lad or not, but like those three. Mm -hmm. But this idea that like, we're going to let majors cook but then we're gonna kill the variant. I don't know if that's the right move, like as opposed to having a dominant evil Kang variant or variants that are continuing to propagate throughout these shows. It almost feels like we're getting a bait and switch as to which villain we're supposed to actually root against. He got banished into the quantum realm. He was in prison. Yet we don't see what the fuss was about. 
We just knew he was crazy. We didn't see the worst if he was the worst of them all, right? And I think that's what was lacking from this king. I think that's what most people were wanting to see more of, perhaps to see, to understand where he was coming from and what he was kept from doing and seeing him on that path of getting there. I don't know if, I mean, uh, is it conf is it confirmed that he's dead? I don't know. Um, but if he is, that's what that would that bothered me, Brian. I was like, damn, they killed him. That's it. I I, I get that we got an infinite amount of Kangs, right? But I don't want to see an infinite. Amount. It, after a while, it gets a little bit. You know what I'm saying? I want to see what the story is about and who's who. That's the thing. You want to be hooked by. Okay, is. I get it that he's he's a villain with a lot of forms, but at some point, maybe it's these three. There have to be rep repetition. There has to be some sort of consistency, right? Where it's okay. This is the guy that we need to stop. And I understand, like in the Kang mythology, one of the more interesting things we we haven't seen yet, but are almost certain to get, is that we're going to get Kang versus Kang. That is going to happen because that's what happens in the comics. Kang fights himself, as we've seen and inferred. But there's going to be good Kangs and all that sort of stuff. But it is that's where i'm seeing the divergence from thanos not working as much that you don't have the same north star villain that you're actually like okay that's the guy who's coming to get our heroes and it's kind of been like each version he who remains and now this king have both said yeah i seem bad but wait till you see the other guy and at some point we kind of need to see the other guy who <laughs> we're supposed to fight and I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I just, it's a, it's a choice they've made. And so far it's, it's, it's not connecting. And I'm just wondering, is it, yeah, I don't know. Is, is it just, and it's weird. Cause like I said, no way home hit. And that was clearly a multiverse type of story. I'm fascinated to see if Flash is as good as they say, that is a multiverse yeah. story. Hands down. Yeah. Yeah. So like if, if you get audiences gravitating to the Sony slash Spider-Man multiverse and the Flash DC multiverse and they Reject Looking at the Marvel more. That's that's tough. They reject the OGs that started this, right? Or really, actually, Spider Man started it, right? The, the multiverse with into the Spider Verse, right? Oh uh, yeah, actually, great point. The Spider Verse animated. I guess you could even argue Endgame introduced that idea, right? When they're kind of doing the time heist and the Ancient One is explaining to Bruce Banner, right, that idea. They, they're kind of were putting the feelers out with that. But you're right. Into the Spider-Verse actually was highly successful and profitable in telling a multiversal story. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, let us know so, in the comments. Well, yeah. You want to talk sorry. about the VFX? Oh, yeah. What's up? What's up? So what happened with the VFX? They, so they're blaming yeah. the look of it because <laughs> the VFX was all messed up. What happened Which, there? Which, amazingly, I think we were both in agreement. It wasn't, it, like, it was inconsistent, but I don't think it was, like, the make or break for our viewing experience for this film. But it has come up again. And as long as this keeps coming up, it's going to be an issue for Marvel. So Vulture has a piece on this. You can check it out. Where they talk to people who worked on both Ant-Man 3 and Wakanda Forever. And some pretty damning statements where they said... Um, Quote, filmmakers and studio executives nitpicked and revised vast swaths of quantum mania without budgeting time enough to implement the changes. That's one. Number two, Marvel is doubling down as much as possible on constricting quality. They're squeezing blood out of the stones and we are out of blood, end quote. Number two. And number three, which I thought was probably the most interesting, was that they said... Quote, critical resources were diverted away, meaning from Ant-Man, to Black Panther Wakanda Forever. All the money, all the best resources went to that. And it did diminish the ability to carry Ant-Man all the way through. And that I would say you can see. Because as I said, you there's definitely scenes where it looks fine to me. And then there's scenes where it looks really sloppy. And that yeah. quote was like, well, that kind of explains it. So... I mean, what do you make of this still being such a massive issue behind the scenes for that? I think it has, Brian, to do with um, 
some of the same issues they were having before, just having too much to do and having a back backlog and having deadlines and working around the clock and people, you know, just going, this looks fine and moving on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When you're doing so much or trying to put out so much, you get quality control gets crazy. You know, and, and it loses the 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 quality it previously had. So I, I blame that on that. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a great point. And it doesn't show I think that when you do that, it doesn't show the proper respect to your audience, which is way too sophisticated and is plunking down more money than ever to go see these projects to give them that I think is a real disservice. And like I will say, look, I mean, I I will never be the biggest avatar fan. Cause it's just not the world that I think is the coolest. Yeah. But you know, you want the other end of the spectrum. It's James Cameron, man. Cause that it, there are large stretches of that movie in 3d where you're just like, I don't, I don't believe how this is possible. I don't believe that you can make a world look this good underwater. And you just, you appreciate the visual skill of someone who takes 13 years at a time <laughs> to make a movie but does it with the care that like every shot visually, you're just like, all right, like this is a whole different level of expertise. He wants his audience to go for an experience and that's what he does. That's his thing. And, and fans appreciate it. And it shows, it shows in them in the money it makes, yeah, you know, exactly. so what else can you do? But just give him the praise that he deserves and give him whatever he wants. Cause he'll let you know what he's done. <laughs> Um, wow, that was a good show. Let, uh, let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of Ant, uh, Ant-Man 2 and what it's done overseas. And again, we're still going to have to question the future of the MCU. I mean, they have a lot to do. Hopefully, Brian, based on what they've said in terms of delivering content to us on, at a specific pace addresses a lot of our cons- the, the problems that they're experiencing now, Brian. That's all we can hope for. Yeah. That's all we there's can hope so, for. I think there's so much pressure on Guardians 3 to be both a critical and commercial, like, resounding success because I just don't see any possible way the Marvels is going to be the answer to their problems later this year. Let us know in the comment section below what you guys think. Hit that like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Gen Report. Stop! Don't do it! The people!